My name is Harry Hughes, and I suppose I'm here today because I'm half Kelly. My mother is Maura Kelly from Four Doors up the road. She was a daughter of PJ Kelly, and uh, we're very proud of our Kelly connection. Uh, so we obviously extend to you, Kid, we look forward to the Kelly gathering here this weekend, and we hope you have a wonderful weekend and that the sun will, the sun will shine upon your visits. Uh, Co Patrick is really a beacon in the landscape of this area. And uh, so what I'm going to try and do is to explain the, uh, the history of Crow Patrick, the archaeology of Crow Patrick, the landscape and the various different visitors that have come here over the years. So I have up here the earliest reference to St. Patrick and Crow Patrick. It comes from the Book of Armagh, which is in Trinity College. It's probably the second most important book in Trinity College after the Book of Kells. And um, it is a library of books which, was, which were assembled by the Archbishop of Armagh uh, well over a thousand years ago. One of the writers in that book is called Chair Khan, and Chair Khan records St. Patrick's visit in Connacht, particularly. So this is the particular page that references him coming to Ahagawr, so you see Ahagawr there, and then after his visit in Ahagawr, you see he comes to Morrisk. So Patrick intended to come, and it says in this book, that Patrick proceeded to Mons Aglai. So of course, before Cole Patrick, it was known as Mons Aglai, which is Eden Mountain. And he intended to fast there for 40 days, following the example of other great prophets, such as Moses, Elias, and Jesus. And um, so, I suppose you can split history into two parts, of history and prehistory. History really started when Patrick came, because we have no written manuscripts in Ireland before Patrick coming. So the only form of any writing was own writing, but it was a very limited way of passing on information. So St. Patrick's arrival in Ireland brought us the Latin scholars with him, and he also brought Latin writing. So this is written in Latin. Uh, 200 years later, they start writing in Irish. As I said, Cronaglai was the name of the mountain. When did this start changing its name? The writers of the Middle Ages started changing the name around the 10th century to the 11th, and it became known as Cruach Forig. And uh, later on in the 1600s and 1700s, it was anglicised into Crow Patrick. So this landscape and its orbit, you cannot just look at Crow Patrick on its own. You have to look at Crow Patrick and its orbit. It's a sacred landscape. To us today, we don't see this. But to ancient man, this was probably the most central part of Ireland. And you will find here, at the front, you have Anuk, which is the salt marsh going out to Morris. You have at the back of the mountain, you have Bohe, and you have Cahar Island out to the right. So the whole area for a 10 mile radius is a sacred landscape. But of course, this landscape is scarred from previous peoples who were here. We have, for example, the Lazy Beds, which could have been from the famines, of a previous time, the 1840s, it could have been the 1880s. So people have come and lived here and loved here, but they've also left traces behind them. So I want to speak about the damage we're doing on the landscape. I think a lot of the relics of what they have left haven't damaged the landscape. But we have a particular issue at the moment of say, erosion going on in Kirkpatrick. So I will come back to the erosion in a moment. This is looking in from the north side facing into the mountain. But geographically, uh, you see there are two quarries. So it was obviously it's, it was obviously here in the Ice Age, uh, and, and quarries were formed. This particular quarry is of interest to us. It's known as Lugnanyaun, which is the Valley of the Demons, which is the legendary place where, Ban uh, where Patrick banished the snakes from Ireland. So if you take tourism, it's the one piece of tourism and legend we don't sell in this part of the world. You go down to Blarney, they tell you you kiss the Blarney stone and you get the gift of the gab. And we all know if you kiss a girl who kiss the Blarney stone, you'll be twice as good. But <laughs> unfortunately, for some reason, tourism bodies here don't recognise the heritage value of Kirkpatrick. Both the legend, the heritage and the history of it. So you can see, this is the main pathway for rising up to the mountain. It's quite steep on the way up. You have a flat section at the back and then you have a very steep section which is called Castle Boric, which is Patrick's Causeway. Traditionally, people climbed one side and came down the other side. So you have the first station is just at the crest here. Uh, on the summit of the second station, 
and the third station, which is really Wirra, is just out on the west side. So all of these, we will come back to them in a moment. So if one was flying up, this is the type of site that you would see. It's a stunning site. It's a sacred landscape. And it is one that needs to be valued and cherished and protected. This is the summit, and it's in the shape of a human foot. You can see the heel at the back here. You can see the trace of a wall. It's an amazing thing when you walk on the mountain, you kind of see these traces of a wall. Mm -hmm. And that is the archaeology which we speak about later on. So then you can see it's in the shape of a human foot. And this is the path we're coming up from the Murrisk side, which is on the north side of the mountain. And again, this is the other side of the church, which is the heel. So if you come down this pathway, you come down the Lewisburg side of the mountain. And of course, as you can see, you have a stunning view of Westport Town at the top of the slide. This church was built in two parts. The centre part was built in 1905, and the two wings were built in the patrician year of 1961. Hmm. We know that on the 17th of March, in 1113, over 900 years ago, that 30 people were killed by lightning on the summit of the mountain. So, probably the 17th of March, you cannot guarantee its weather. But previous to the 1100s, the pilgrimage to the mountain was on the day of Patrick's death. But in, la in latter years, it has come more, to, uh, more as part of the festival of Lunasa, which is the last Sunday of July. Now, this is a photograph probably from the 1940s. As you can see, it's a very clear path, um, and it's a singular path which has been used for hundreds of years, probably been used for more than 1,500 years. And it's narrow. So as I said at the beginning, we have a problem here. Because you can see that the path has remained narrow most of the way, but people are making new pathways coming out here. This photograph is about 15 years old. And you will see the damage that has occurred in this mountain on our sacred landscape in 15 years. This is just another view of it. And again, as you can see, it is creating a very big scar. And all the peat that is on both sides of this has been eroded away. And this is a clear review again. So the path is ballooning out, and people are ballooning out on all sides around it. So as you can see, there's no control here. So we have a local authority, and we have national authorities. The amazing thing about this place, if this was in any other developed country in Europe, this pathway would be taken care of. 100,000 people climb this mountain each year. You go to Wales, and you've got Mount Snowdon, they have 100,000 visitors. The pathway is both marked and improved and corrected. You go to Scotland, they have been Nevis. It's another mountain with 100,000 climbers. And the state authorities take it over. Here we have the most important tourism site. And for some reason, nobody seems to care. It's all acceptable that we can run athletic events up here. It's acceptable we can walk on any side of the mountain, create any erosion that we want. And nobody seems to do anything about it. Now, it is a statutory authority is meant to provide roadways wherever you are going. And I would say the County Council have been at fault here. The State has been at fault here. The Office of Public Works has been at fault here. And the usual excuse that they roll out why they cannot do anything is, well, this is private land. Well, so is the Greenway. In actual fact, this is the original Greenway. You could go up Cropatrick without meeting a car or a bicycle, and millions have done it since it started. They say, well, what about insurance? Has anybody bothered to ring Mount Snowden, where there are full-time people in office? Has anybody bothered to ring Ben Nevis? Has insurance is not an issue there? In actual fact, in 2,000 years, nobody has ever claimed on this mountain for falling. Mm. You know, and you could claim against the landowners. So it's time we got serious about the mountain and the landscape. And I think this is a particularly galling shot in that the original pathway is going up here in the middle, and we're opening up all of these new pathways here. If this keeps going on for another 20, 30 years, we will have a scar that will last for a thousand years here, because it's taken hundreds of years for this peak to grow. And you can actually see it here. This is this pathway on the right that I was pointing out. The original pathway was all came up where there are large boulders and large scree and stone, which is very hard to move. As you can see, we're now down to the soil here. And the erosion in 20 years since that pathway was opened is this. So we read in the mail news about people concerned about Kirkpatrick. 
But you have to visualize, this, this is about four foot of erosion. So we need two things. We need an authority, whether it's the county council or the state, to do something about this mountain. It can it go on. And we need people then to respect the signage and the pathways which are put in place.